All right. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to uh, Australian Made Our Way, or Essential Australia, as I called it internally. I'm very happy to have each of you on our webinar today. I'm Ron Edwards, Director of Wine Education for Winebow, but I will not really be your host tonight. I am uh, handling the Q&A, which, by the way, do not put any questions in the chat window. I won't be watching that. That's If you want to talk to each other, that's great. But if you have a question for Mark, uh, then we need to put that in the Q&A box, and I will monitor those questions and squeeze them in as we have time. And I'm, I'm really pleased that uh, Mark Davidson was able to join us. Um, he is a great resource for the entire Americas. But uh, Mark was born in London, raised in Sydney. Mark has over 35 years of experience in the hotel, restaurant, and wine business, 15 of which were as a sommelier. Uh, in 2001, he was named Sommelier of the Year in Vancouver Wine Festival, which is pretty awesome. And he also won the Spirited Industry Professional Award, and his energy uh, makes sense for that award, for sure. Uh, as a department head and instructor with the International Sommelier Guild, he was instrumental in the ongoing development of the, gov of the curriculum and has taught classes in Vancouver, Seattle, Portland, San Francisco, Los Angeles, San Diego, and Las Vegas, and, and a whole lot more classes than that since becoming the educator for Wine Australia, which he is for the Americas. Welcome, Mark. Great to have you with us. Thanks, Ron. Lovely introduction. Thank you very much. Pleasure to, pleasure to be here. Um, and as I try and highlight for, for, for these sorts of sessions, the individual geeky details about all the specific wines that you guys sell, that's easy enough for you guys to follow up on what I'm hoping to achieve today and the subsequent sessions. We're at one a month uh, heading into uh, February. Um, <clears throat> is for you guys just to maybe you know have you guys walk away with armed with a bit more confidence about Australia and um, the language about trying to sell Australia and the various regions to people. And that's kind of my primary aim here. Now, my presumption is that there might be some of the original um, negotiant um, um, sales team involved in this, in which case some of this stuff might be sort of a review for you. But I like to always uh, remind people, I've been doing this for now, focused on Australia now for almost 10 years, just over 10 years. And whenever I hear someone I respect talking about uh, um, Australian wine, say Mike Benny or, or you know James Halliday. I always feel like it's great because even if you do understand something about it, uh, the way people approach it, there might be just something in there that's a little trigger for you to be able to feel more confident about the area that you are about to learn about. So anyway, Australia, because I know a lot of you guys have come over from Mondovino side of the, um, the business, so Australia is probably a bit new to you. Um, so hopefully we can deal with some of the preconceived ideas, the old notions about what Australia is and you know what it really isn't. So um, let's launch into this. And please interrupt any time, I mean, through via Ron. And Ron, uh, feel free to just interrupt me when you've got a bunch of questions. I'm not as big a fan of let's leave all the questions to the end. If there's something that's cool and contemporary about where we're, you know, where we're at, happy to stop and answer those questions. So uh, I will not be offended. I'm Australian. I don't offend easily. No worries. I'll, I'll jump in as needed, and I may wave at you if there's something I just want to comment on along the way. Okay, cool. I'm going to get my presentation is not moving. Well, come on. Why is that? You can always uh, unshare and come back as needed. I think I might need to. It's not moving. It seems to be frozen. I'm going to stop sharing for a moment. I'm going to go back in and share again. While he's doing that, I'm just going to make a couple of comments that, that I know we are trying to reinforce across the winescape of the United States, and that is that Australia is a continent. There is no sameness in Australia. You can't use the label Australian wine, just like we don't use the label North American wine or even Californian wine. Um, there is so much diversity here. It, perhaps there was a disservice done at one point, but we are the people. We are the messengers now to make sure that our clients and their clients know that every location in Australia has something different to offer. And it's from one producer to the next. There is no sameness, uh, which is when you start digging in a little deeper is one of the more exciting things about Australia is the variety. Absolutely true. And I think that's the, certainly the thing I battled when I first started with this job was the uh, concept of Australian wine. And, um, I think in, in fairness, it was probably promoted that way, Australia, sunshine in a bottle and, and uh, you know, where you go. And I've even had people in the industry recently, people who should know better say, I love Australia. That's such a great region. Um, 
it's a country <laughs> with 65 different regions. So anyway, hopefully we'll uncover a little bit of what makes Australia cool and interesting. And then by extension, I'm going to focus in not talking about the details about the specific wines that you guys sell, but the wineries that you have in your portfolio, because some of you may not really be aware of why they are so significant within their regions and to the history of Australian uh, and the future of Australian wine. So anyway, quick overview, sort of a 10,000 foot view of Australia, Australia one-on-one if you like. Um, quick note about this though, I do want you guys to note that a lot of this information I've had from this has come directly from our website. Take a moment to go look at it. It's at www.australianwinediscover.com. The PowerPoints I'm using are all downloadable from there. Plus, in addition to those PowerPoints on all of these subjects, there is educator notes, which essentially study guides or additional things, whether that's the detail you want to go into or not. But for those of you more geeky inclined, you can uh, download all sorts of cool information. So uh, yeah, australianwinediscover.com. Go there, use it. Valuable. We do. Good. <laughs> Okay, a little history of Australian wine. I'm not going to go through the slides line by line. I'll just pick on certain elements here. I think the key thing to note about the early days in Australia was that grapes did not exist. They had to be brought into Australia, and they were brought in in the uh, late 1700s with the original uh, first fleet of convicts. I like to use the word settlers. It seems a little gentler. Um, but the reality is that uh, grapes were planted then. But we can't really talk about the expansion of uh, grape growing and any serious winemaking until about the 18, the mid 1800s, not much was happening in those early days, largely because there's no one there, um, <clears throat> but also there wasn't much expertise. And it was a bit of a shotgun approach, even with James Busby, who came in and that went back to, to he was a botanist that was uh, had gone down to Australia. He went back to Europe to collect vine species and other plants as well, but vines specifically. So he, he's, he's credited with it being the sort of the forefather of, of viticulture in Australia because he was systematic in his approach. Those grapes were planted in the 1830s. Add to that fact that there's no phylloxera, we'll discuss this in a moment, in parts of Australia. Some of that original material he brought over is still growing today in various areas. Uh, quick run through the uh, early eras. We definitely had a fortified era, and you'll see this uh, throughout all the regions with almost no exception. Uh, the early, region, the early uh, wine production in Australia from the 1900s to the 40s, 50s, and even into the 60s, Fortified wine was the big deal. It was what was being drunk in the UK and us being a colony adopted that and also made it to ship back to the UK. Plus, it became sort of the drink, if you like. We were drinking a lot of fortifieds. That changed from the 60s. From the 40s to the 60s, started to, to uh, a, a change a fair bit. And then really from the 60s onwards is when it really changed and the culture changed. Uh, but eating habits changed, drinking habits changed. So red wine sales started to boom in the 70s. Cabernet started to go up at that point. And by the 80s, we were the 18th largest exporter. And uh, by the early 1900s, the sixth. So, right, you know, we were really becoming known for exporting wines. And the most, for the most part, they were fun, affordable, easy drinking wines that the world really wanted at that time. Clean, easy drinking, varietally correct wines. Um, then we ran into to some, some issues with that image. But here's a couple of key points that uh, you can look at from this presentation. It's certainly going to be made available to you guys afterwards. But... Yeah, so I think the old vine discussion is an important piece of the puzzle, especially when we delve into to Barossa, which we will do today, um, because not many people know that we actually have the largest collection of old vine material anywhere on the planet, ungrafted, original pre phylloxera vines, which is kind of cool. Not a quality determining statement, but just an interesting historical uh, element, I think. Here's what, obviously, we're not going to be covering all of Australia. That's just impossible. And our, even our education site doesn't largely because a lot of it's to do with what is available in the world out there rather than it's not like we're going to do a module on, um, you know, Paracuta. Uh, the reality is that what we need to do is have the major ones out there. And that's what's going to, to happen throughout this series and also um, what you'll see on our website. I think these next couple of slides are really helpful for your, um, not necessarily in selling wines as much, but just giving you a sense of perspective. Australia is a big country, um, but we're not as big a producer as people seem to think. And I think the narrative is a bit skewed. But for example, you've got wineries in your portfolio from Margaret River, which is just south of uh, Perth there on that map. So you'd essentially be sitting in Morocco. Hunter Valley, um, which you don't have, but certainly in Canberra District, which is just south of Sydney there, you'd be just south and, and, and sort of east of Bulgaria. So there's a large geographic spread. So saying, making major statements about, the, say, the climate and the, uh, the lay of the land in Australia, 
is difficult. That being said, I mean, the vast majority of Australia is not suited to viticulture because it's either too far north or too tropical or it's desert. So viticulture is very much um, uh, centered around the places that have mitigating factors that allow us to be able to produce really high quality uh, uh, grapes and, and subsequent wines from that. But because the climate has been mitigated to the fact that uh, to, to a point where you can actually do that. Here's a really cool map. Just a quick clear. Yeah, go ahead, Don. When you tell the audience that they were south, that Margaret River would be like being in Morocco. That's not a latitude statement. That was just no. referencing the European map on top of the Australian map. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, we're not talking about latitudes here at all. <laughs> um, yeah, it was just about a geographic sort of distance. Uh, the cool thing here about this is that um, while we are not an insignificant country for, for grape growing and wine production, our area under vine is about 135,000 hectares. Obviously, that number moves year to year, but we've been hovering around 135 to 140,000 hectares for years now. That covers about 0.02% of Australia's land mass. And in total, that's like a little bit less than Bordeaux and Burgundy combined. So the reality is we're not as big as people think. You could add, I mean, it will also say we're about the same size as the Long Dock. Again, not an insignificant area under vine, but I think it's important to remember the narrative around Australia is always seems to lead off with these large global brands that have been very successful and, and rightly so that's cool but as i said to a california friend of mine who works in the wine business when he was making fun of yellowtail i said yeah but how would you like california to be defined or thought of as oh right that's the place that does i don't know sutter sutter home white zinfandel or behringer white zinfandel just the wrong sort of like it's just not the right narrative underneath those successful large successful global brands sit sort of close to 3,000 small to medium-sized producers, all, you know, a lot of um, cool, you know, a lot of what you have in your portfolio fits into that family-run, small to medium-sized businesses. Climate is varied in Australia. There are some things you can say that are consistent, like the middle of the country is fairly hot and dry uh, consistently, but I think the latitude, maritime, maritime influences and elevation all contribute to this. And the whole point is that in Australia, you've got to get further away from the equator, which means further south, and you need the ocean or elevation as an influence to sort of mitigate what would otherwise be a too hot a climate. Same thing you can apply for any of, the, uh, any of you who know California really well. It's a great, great comparison in some ways in that if the temperature of the Pacific wasn't what it is off of the coast of California, the vast majority of California vineyard areas likely wouldn't exist. That cold ocean is a really important factor in, in allowing for premium uh, quality uh, wine regions and wine, wine production. So all in the south here. <clears throat> so latitude, got to get further south. That just makes sense. That's a real simple way to look at things. The Our air conditioning unit, if you like, is the Southern Ocean. It's moderate, that moderates pretty much all of Australia's famous wine regions to a greater or lesser degree. And if it's not that, it's about higher uh, um, elevation, which we'll get to in a moment. That's some, just these maps are in here to give you a bit of a, a bit of a look, but you've got to remember here, the important thing is all the cooler temperatures down the South here. You now, next stop Antarctica, and that's, you know, it's cold, cold Southern Ocean here. Um, Altitude, important piece of the puzzle in Australia. There are more vineyards at altitude than people realize in Australia. Um, and just that basic equation for people to understand, uh, for every 100 meters, we've done the conversion for our American friends, 328 feet, roughly speaking. Um, you are talking about 0 0.65 degrees Celsius average temperature cooler. So, you know, you've got three, four, 500 meters, the average temperature is quite a bit cooler. Bud break is later. Um, Harvest is later and harvest is in, in cooler conditions when you do get up into those uh, higher elevations. So there are a lot of mountain ranges. Okay, we're not talking Swiss Alp type ranges in Australia, but they are mountain ranges nonetheless, and they have a major impact on the, the great growing uh, conditions and uh, areas in Australia. Just pick on, you've got running right down the sort of eastern flank of Australia is what's called the Great Dividing Range. It affects you know, a lot of what we're gonna talk about in, in New South Wales with Canberra District and Hunter Valley. Uh, but let's pick on Mount Lofty Ranges because that affects Barossa. Just mm -hmm. to give you some perspective here, without Mount Lofty Ranges, which right now sit at about 750 meters at, the, at their highest, um, used to be, we're going to talk about the age of Australia as a continent shortly, but that used to be Everest in proportion. Um, like we're talking, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of feet high, but it's an old eroded country. So they now sit uh, at lower elevations. But Mount Lofty Ranges affects Clare Valley. Barossa Valley, Eden Valley, Adelaide Hills, McLaren Vale, 
And so without Mount Lofty Ranges, there's a strong chance that what's sitting right here would be ocean meets desert, which is kind of what it's like on the western side of uh, uh, South Australia. So the range, the mountain range is really important for the viticulture. I'm going to skip through the next slides because it's just about classification of climate, general sort of classifications and where some of the major regions fit. But just to sort of indicate to you that we have different types of uh, 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 climates. So continental, obviously more inland, less than classic sort of hot summers, uh, cold winters. Inside, it's usually sitting in, in, in large bodies of uh, uh, land and not really affected by the ocean. So it does exist. Maritime, places like Adelaide Hills, Coonawarra, Mornington and Tasmania. Uh, and then Mediterranean is different from um, maritime in the sense that it's a bit warmer. The summers are warmer and tend to be a bit drier. The Barossa Valley, which we're about to look at, and McLaren Vale and Margaret River. Margaret River is a bit of a funny one. It's not straight sort of Mediterranean. There's a different sort of maritime influence there as well. It's hard to call it cool maritime. Quick look at the old soils in Australia. Again, not necessarily quality determining. But um, I always love the whole old world, new world discussion, which was far more relevant 30 or 40 years ago when um, uh, Hugh Johnson termed the or coined the phrase. But the reality is it was about sort of wine styles. But geologically speaking, Europe is new world and Australia is old world and it's not even close. Now, again, that's not a quality determining statement, but the reality is that um, it's been a landmass for over 100 million years. Australia has probably broke off from the subcontinent around Africa. Uh, some of the oldest uh, soils and geological formations that exist in Australia. It's really old. So there's also some young soils and um, there's limestone and fertile volcanic, but it's incredibly complex for any of you that have studied other parts of the world. And let's pick Alsace, for example. We always talk about what a patchwork quilt that Alsace is. Add that to pretty much any region in Australia, never mind from region to region. It's a really complex um, soil structures there in Australia. And the reality is that a lot of the work is now just starting to be done um, on identifying quality, you know, the, the differences in uh, within each region and the soils and how they affect wine quality. And that's an exciting thing. I think you're starting to see that happen in the McLaren Rail specifically, certainly Barossa. Coonawarra has been isolated, but it's one of the more homogenous strips of soil that exist in for viticulture in Australia anyway. But it's so complex within each region. I thought it was funny, one of the a uh, viticulturist in uh, McLaren was talking to me the other day and he said he had a geologist say that, yes, yeah, so the geology, you've got to remember there's geology and then there's soil. Soil is geological dandruff, which I thought was sort of creepy at first, but actually it's really not a bad discussion because it is sort of like blown in and around. And so anyway, mm. soil is geological dandruff. I'm not sure if that's a great way to sell wine, but anyway. No, that's definitely not a client discussion, but it, is, it does bring it to a certain amount of relevance. Major regions, prominent regions that sit in Australia, this is just a general thing. A lot of what you're dealing with in your portfolio, and I'll talk about your portfolio uh, in sort of different terms later, but you've got a lot of these regions represented in your portfolio, a good portion. Today, we're going to look at Barossa. We're going to look at New South Wales, but it's really a quick overview of New South Wales and the Hunter, because I think you can't not talk about the Hunter, even though you don't have a producer from there. But we're going to talk about Canberra District, because you have a legendary producer from uh, Canberra District, which is fairly new to you guys, and you're really bloody lucky as far as I'm concerned. Okay, Barossa. Um, we're going to talk about the fact that it encompasses the, the, the word Barossa is an important piece of the puzzle, but there are two uh, sections that make up the greater Barossa zone, and that's Barossa Valley and Eden Valley, and we'll talk about the sub, uh, um, sub regions as well. Long history, um, and we're going to talk about that and that the sort of the cultural influence that in Barossa is actually quite different from other areas in South Australia and Australia in general. With great diversity of soils and climates, some of the oldest grapevines exist. We've got uh, right in Barossa alone, we know that you've got the oldest Grenache, oldest um, vineyard for Grenache, Morvedra, and Shiraz, never mind a couple of others. Mm -hmm. Great cultural um, uh, culinary culture based on the sort of the German influence, which we'll try and uncover as well. Barossa sits down here in South Australia. South Australia, bearing in mind, is 50% uh, of total production in Australia, generally speaking, in, in, a, in and around 50% of total production. comes out of the state of South Australia, so it's a really significant state uh, with Barossa. I mean, look around the shelves for premium wines and uh, uh, premium Australian wines in uh, the US. There's a high proportion of South Australia and an even high proportion of Barossa Valley wines. I don't like saying it's like our Napa Valley because I, I think there are there were uh, differences, but in terms of notoriety and in terms of the place, the specific region that people know best of all, 
you'd have to argue that a Bross is pretty, up, uh, pretty much up there. It's actually quite a bit smaller than Napa, but it's maybe not a bad comparison. <clears throat> Here's how it sits. Uh, just outside of Adelaide, um, you've got the Barossa on one side, Eden Valley on the other. That's the great Barossa zone there, but I've got some other maps that uh, might sort of uh, break that down a little bit better. Um, 1830s is when it kind of started. You have to remember the South Australia Company, essentially, it was called the South Australia Company. It was a deed granted to a guy called John Fife Angus. It was given essentially a large swath of what became South Australia. Um, and that was happened in the that was established in in the 1830s. And then soon after Barossa, um, soon after that was uh, formed, it was really interesting because the Silesian immigrants, there was Lutheran immigrants that were suffering religious persecution. They approached John Fife Angus. One of their pastors approached uh, John Fife Angus, said, "We will come over, um, uh, you know, because it's you know." technically the um, religious persecution, but the reality was that they said, we're not going to come over as individual families. We will come over as communities and we'll farm within parts of South Australia um, and largely Barossa, they farmed as communities. And it really kind of makes sense when you start thinking about the names in Barossa compared to say McLaren Vale or somewhere else, Henschke, Dutchke, Lehman, um, they're all Germanic sounding names. And that's because up until there was a period of time where German was the spoken language in uh, Barossa. And for anyone that's been there, and you sometimes meet some of the really old growers, and they've been there for four and five generations, and there is still a slightly Germanic twang, and they call it Barossa Deutsch. It's still spoken in Barossa, albeit a lot, lot less than it used to be, but it used to be the language. And I think that's really important because Barossa has developed very differently than other parts. A little bit in the Adelaide Hills, but just an hour or so south, you're in uh, McLaren Vale, and it, it was English, so it's kind of cool. I think Ross is very unique for that. So late 1800s through the 60s, fortified wines, again, were an extremely important piece of the puzzle, and there are some absolutely brilliant fortified wines. That's for a different discussion. I think you have one or two of them in, uh, in uh, by association from Yolumba, but there's some amazing fortified wines. The legacy that we now have because of this fortified wine production is brilliant, but that's, again, for a discussion some other time. 70s, this uh, diversity starts to happen. People start planting more varieties. Um, more Cabernet starts to go in the ground in, in the 70s. Um, then the 90s to the 2000s, I think Barossa unfortunately got tarred with a, a brush that was um, largely instigated by the fact that there were a few importers who started to bring wines to Robert Parker at the time that they thought would definitely appeal to his palate, and they did. Not a lot of them represented necessarily what was happening at the time, but they were just big, very extracted, very concentrated wines, some of which weren't even that well known in Australia. Appealed to, to Robert Parker. Everyone got excited about them. And then 10 years later, they were kind of bored with them because they were 16% alcohol, really oaky, really concentrated, and really didn't represent, I don't think, necessarily what Barossa was good at. Was Barossa able to produce that? Yeah, sure. Any warm climate region can. But I think it, it tarred it with a brush. And then it also unfortunately had a a sort of broader effect on Australia, which was, oh, we've looked at cheap and cheerful Australia. That was fun. Um, now we've looked at boutique Australia and that was it. No, thanks. It's too big. It's too heavy. And all manner of complexity was lost in the shuffle there, unfortunately. Um, and so now we've, you know, we've slowly come out of that. Um, we're going to talk about the Brussels Old Vine Charter just off to the side here a little bit in the moment. I think that's a really important piece of the uh, puzzle. But I think this, so I don't think Australia was reinventing itself as much as just repositioning itself for people to understand what the realities of Australia have always been. Uh, it's just that they were promoted, was sort of promoted in the, in the incorrect way. That being said, I do think even in the sort of 10 years that I've been working focused specifically on Australian wine, I've seen absolutely astonishing changes in terms of how people are approaching their winemaking and their viticulture. And I think it's really led to a sort of a freshness and a vibrancy in the wines that we hadn't seen before, and I think that's pretty exciting. So while I think a lot of stuff did exist and just wasn't out, you know, it was sort of hiding in the shadows, there has been an adjustment. Yeah, there totally has. And, and or people who were doing it are still doing it, right? Like I sat down at our first tasting when I was invited over there, and we tasted through eight wines from across the, the country, mostly South Australia, uh, because they were our hosts, and not one wine was over 14 too. Yeah. Most of them were like 13, three, 13, four, yeah. uh, which is just speaks to balance and climactic differences that we just weren't seeing in this country when we needed to have that foundational knowledge about what Australia could do. We, we were 
given the wines that we liked from our own country too, right? We had the same issue going on in California. So why wouldn't mm-hmm. we order the same wines from somewhere else? So uh, that that is, yes, an unfair um, an unfair reputation that wasn't deserved at all. No, and I think and there are some wines like that that still exist in Barossa and other mm-hmm. regions. I don't necessarily want those big concentrated wines to go away. I just don't think it's just it's one piece of the puzzle and, and um, it's harder and harder to find them. But I also have this theory I develop theories while I'm drinking in bistros and bars, and usually they're quite good. Um, but I just think when you are a wine drinking nation, and we think we're a wine drinking nation here in the US, and we're not, we're not even close. And that's not a criticism, it's just an observation. But Australia is actually, ha- has become, I think for su- consumption per capita is probably two, maybe even three times that, that, than, that it is uh, here in the US. People drink wine a lot. And I have this theory that when you're drinking wine a lot, you don't want big and heavy. Like when wine becomes a daily beverage, you need something that has some lightness and works with the food. When it's a special occasion beverage, impact and power works. And I think, you know, I, I don't know that that's, you know, that's true across the board, but I think there is some th- something to say for that because the lightness and the deafness of touch I'm seeing now in Australia and frankly in California too, the better California wines, it's because you're drinking wine all the time. You want it to go with food and it's not a cocktail. It's a... <laughs> an mm-hmm. accompaniment for the most part so that's another discussion anyway Barossa it's uh, really cool there are um, sub regions there but the two main ones are the Barossa Valley which is the Barossa Valley floor I mean they include some hilly areas and then up higher is the Eden Valley region and then there's a subsection in there called the High Eden so just to look at the map here you can see I think this map's kind of cool in that it shows you the concentration of viticulture never mind the larger sort of Barossa zone you see where Eden Valley fits in, to, uh, it fits in, and also the Brossa Valley. The concentration of grapevines in Brossa Valley far exceeds that of Eden Valley. A lot of that's to do with the ease of being able to plant, but also just the the lie of the land. Eden Valley is much more challenging. We'll look at that in a moment. And here, this map also shows a little bit of. Uh, I'm not sure how well that's showing up on your screens there, but it kind of shows you. It's a sort of a relief map. Kind of shows you a little bit about the elevation. So once you get up to the um, uh, on the right hand side of that sort of dividing line, uh, around up and around Angerston and up higher, you can see Kyneton up there. That's near where Henchke is based. That's a little bit lower in elevation, 300 meters above sea level, 300 350, and that's better for Reds typically in that section. Head down into Hyden, which for you guys is Pusey Vale. We're looking at five to 550 meters above sea level. So we're looking at some, you know, generally speaking, good Riesling country, which we know for, for Eden Valley, but also this good Viognier yeah, and good Chardonnay out there as well. Mm-hmm. Quick uh, lay of the land again. I'm going to skip through this. You guys can look at this. It's essentially a Mediterranean uh, type climate, the latitude and altitude you can look at at your, uh, at your leisure. Again, this complexity that exists overall, you've got uh, rich deep soils there. Uh, lots of clay loam and sandy soils. There are some sandy patches in, in and around the place called Vinevale where Pusey, uh, sorry, where um, your lumber has the nursery and also you, you have some really good Grenache there. So there's some borderline walking on a beach type beach sand in, in the middle of the Barossa there. But a lot of complex uh, sandy loams and, and uh, red and brown clays as well. There's some work in terms of separating the sub regions of the sub districts of Barossa. Um, they've had some um, issues. You can go to Barossa, um, Barossa Valley's website and they can show you how they've sort of done the northern section, western section. There are actual sub-regions called Sepultsfield, uh, Kunanga. The problem with the utilization of those names is they're actually brands of wines and there's uh, they've run into some uh, struggles with that. I'm not sure what the future is for that. Quick Eden Valley snapshot, same thing. Mediterranean, but it's a lot cooler up there. There's a bigger diagonal. It's more continental. Yes, it's Mediterranean because they, they are fairly close, but you're looking at more continental type climate up at Eden Valley. And really, stru- stru- it's like windy, it's cold, it's really um, skinny sort of skeletal soils that really are quite challenging to plant. And some, some areas, it's not feasible. Some, some areas, it's actually quite, quite uh, suitable. In other areas, it's just a challenge. It's too rocky and too difficult and too exposed. Louisa Rose described it to us as just a, a different way of heat accumulation in that it's not so much that it doesn't get as warm in the daytime in Eden. It just is warm for a lot less time. It takes longer yeah. longer and it drops off a lot faster. So you have a much longer ripe. Well, you definitely have a like even a month longer uh, for the same grape between the two regions of ripening. Exactly. You've got this longer hang time, but it's but it is a shorter, shorter, hotter, but not hotter, but it's a shorter growing day. But it's bitterly cold. I've taken a certain perverse, and I've done it so many times in this particular vineyard site, which is one of yours, Pusey's. 
Um, I, this shot is more about showing the lay of the land rather than the venue. You can see in the background that's rocky, it's exposed. That's sitting at about 550 meters and higher if you look up the hill there. Mm -hmm. um, but I've taken perverse pleasure in getting trade out to Australia and we got to Pusey Vale and it's absolutely howling and cold and windy and rainy. And when people say, how can you grow Riesling here in the Bross? It's like, does that make sense now? Yep, yep, got it. Let me get in the car. It's, uh, it's chilly. It's, it's bitterly cold um, up in that vineyard side at times. But as you say, it doesn't mean the, the daytime temperatures can't be warm. Quick overview of viticulture and winemaking the Barossa. It's sort of, yeah, there's about 500 different grape growers. There are still lots of growers that are just doing that. They grow grapes. They've got small vineyard sites, family-run vineyard sites, sometimes fifth and sixth generation growers that are still selling. Or, you know, um, there, there tends to be more sort of recognition of particular old um, growers' uh, families' names on the, the labels now. That's a really nice uh, move in Barossa. More focus on sustainable, sustainable viticultural practices in places like Barossa and McLaren Vale, the benign climate there, there's no excuse for it and people are definitely pushing towards it. You can have a look at the harvest dates there at your leisure, obviously a bit later and quite a bit later when you get to High Eden. Mm -hmm. Old Vines, is, is, it's a great story. And again, I, I'm always careful to, to not want to sort of put quality determining factors on this, but it's a lovely story being able to, to say that for Shiraz, Grenache, Cabernet, all, the, all those varieties that you see up there, they've probably got the oldest vines anywhere in the world that exist in Barossa. Um, Shiraz, 1843, that's the Freedom Vineyard from um, Langmile. You've got 1850 or 1848 from Cirillo's Grenache. You've got uh, Mataro from 1853 or uh, Dean Hewitson's wine. So it's awesome. Um, old vines can produce more complex wines. I think there's, it, there's a bit more to it than that. I think that the, the, when I talk to people about, say, Old Vine Shiraz, which is so much of it in Barossa, um, the growers and the winemakers that have been around for a while, they say there's about, it's about a tannin, quality of tannin that exists in Old Vines. That is, it's there, it's persistent and it's firm, but there's something plush and very different about it. And it's not just about the fruit concentration. Um, uh, the, the cool thing too is that you have to also recognize that there's there are some physiological things that old vines seem to do better. Um, they are more tolerant of the vagaries of climate. For example, we are a drought prone country. Barossa is no exception. And so in those drought prone years, um, older vines do better. And many of the old vine vineyards now in, in Barossa that can be, if they want to, they're allowed to irrigate. Many producers don't. We'll talk about that when we get to Henschke. In fact, we're right there. <laughs> Really? This is a good shot, which used to be Hiller Grace and uh, and um, uh, Mount Edelstone used to be irrigated, and they don't haven't done it since it's been over ten years now. Um, and part of the reason is this: what they've put down there is straw. Every two years, they replace this straw that keeps moisture and it keeps the weeds down. And uh, the other problem you've got in Australia on those warm days, you might get a rainfall because it's so warm. The evaporation is quite extraordinary. Um, so you you know this this retains a lot of that moisture. So the vast majority of of old vine vineyards in Barossa are in fact um, dry grown. Remember this this picture. And for those of you, I know there's a few in the team that have been to Hill of Grace, and it's not just because of the legacy and the history. There are certain vineyard sites you go to globally, and I'm lucky enough to have been to various places. You know, standing in Domaine de Romney Conti's vineyards, and they're just special. There's just something incredibly special about them, and this is absolutely one of them. Uh, Barossa Old Vine Charter, cool stuff here. There's no place on the planet that actually classifies or categorizes old vines in Barossa. And I hope I'd like Australia to adopt this across the board, but I don't know if it's going to happen. But the Barossa is doing it. It was taken from Yolumba. Yolumba started this and then Barossa as a region adopted it. And so you can't use the term old vines unless they're 35 years old. Survivor vines is 70 plus. Um, centenarian vines, over 100 probably have just left it at that, but just added the additional one of ancestor vines to anything above 125 years. I love that because you've got to, you know, and they're starting to see that in the, the labels. You're starting to get the little trust mark on the label that covers that. Um, that's new though. That's re you know, relatively new. It's nice to see. And I think it's a really positive move. It's way better than having no idea what it means. Uh, 10 years old, 25 years old, 60 years I mean, old. What does it mean? No, I Great. love, I spent, I spent a lot of my time in France. I spent a lot of time in France before I came back to work for Australia, a lot of time working with French wines as a young sommelier. And I remember always asking those questions. You say, Vivine, what does that mean? And it's like, oh, 25 years or so, there's nothing, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. <laughs> it's like, there's no classification for it, which is fine. It's not a criticism, but old is very different. 
Um, some of these techniques to just sort of think, and I think this is where I do believe there's been, never mind what's going on, a bit of culture in Barossa to sort of shift the styles. I think there's a whole bunch of things happening in the, in the winery too. Picking early for sure is a really important piece of the puzzle. Changing the post-fermentation maceration times to a bit longer, adding whole bunches or adding stem, stems back in, and the different yeast types, that's more about native yeast ferments starting, not using so many so much commercial yeast. They will probably kick in later, but just starting fermentations with uh, uh, normal yeasts, uh, sorry, native yeast, and that tends to give different flavor profiles and actually texture. Playing around, probably the one thing to remember all of this is the shift for red wine production, especially the shift from American oak to French oak and to less oak. Um, in the past, there was always this line, Barossa Shiraz and American Oak. It just keeps absorbing the American Oak. And I'm not sure if that was 100% true. I think there's probably examples. Grange is a good example where that is true. But the reality is that um, I think the quality of oak nowadays and the less use of um, less less percentages of, of new oak, number one, frees up money because that's an important piece of the puzzle. But number two, it's just not necessary. So and you're seeing better balance and you're seeing it as background noise a little bit as opposed to the first thing that you were uh, confronted with. Playing around with different uh, fermentation vessels of, and, and textural sort of elements that that can add, I think has been a really important piece of the puzzle as well. We definitely saw when I was there, not only less new oak, but also a, a, a heavy amount of adoption of larger oak. Larger format. To, yeah. to offer a, a more even tempered oxidation instead of really fast oxidation with a lot of flavor impact too. Um, and you can see the difference in from the day I started buying Australian wine to now for the same producer, there's a marked difference in the, in the approach of elegance as opposed to the approach of like in your face uh, barrel use. So Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then also that wood to wine ratio is a little different with the larger format, but mm -hmm. yeah. And, and, and also, you know, what I'm seeing, we'll get to Grenache in a moment is this, the new oak, like just being pulled away from certain varieties that doesn't work with Grenache being one of them. But major varieties, it's still the top are Shiraz, Cabernet, Grenache. Semillon Chardonnay are planted there and up in the Eden Valley. Shiraz is very important with some very famous vineyard sites, but Riesling is kind of almost king in Eden Valley. Um, also, there's some spots up there where Cabernet does well, Chardonnay does well, Pinot Grigio for more economic reasons, but can be very, very delicious. Quick look at Riesling. 26% of Eden Valley's annual crush. This is the most important uh, white grape variety. And right up there with this Clare Valley and this Eden Valley, um, and right up there with the great Rieslings of the world. But certainly these are the two benchmark regions for Riesling in Australia, period. You also have one of the greatest producers of Riesling, never mind anywhere in, in Australia. It's just, it's like, you know, with Pusey, it's just one of those things where I just, it's, why that's not on by the glass in every place on the planet is always a shock. I mean, well, I don't have enough for it, number one, but it's just magnificent stuff, and we'll get into that in a moment. But I think the characteristics from a good Eden Valley Riesling are that lemon-lime kind of quality, and I would argue there's a bit of a sort of a minerally vein that runs through them. But so uh, Eden Valley Riesling, top-notch stuff. You can look at these little graphs later for your own uh, benefit if you like. I've been banging on about Grenache um, from Australia for the last almost 10 years and the change that's happened with this variety and you're seeing it, it, it started, to be honest, it, Barossa was a little slower to adopt that shift in style in Grenache and the, sh the, the style was started by McLaren Vale and then now you're seeing it kind of everywhere. And what's that shift mean? Uh, Grenache has always been this variety. Of, it got pulled out, a lot of it got pulled out in the um, 80s when there was an economic issue in Barossa and parts of a South America, lots of parts of Australia for that matter. So a lot of old vine Grenache got pulled out, but the reality is it was always this variety that sat in the shadows a little bit. It's, it's oh, excellent for blending, wonderful blending partner, or awesome for fortified wine production because it builds sugars, blah, blah, blah. So it was almost like this, this sort of second cars. And it's just off, off to the side here. Mm -hmm. What's happened recently is people have started to understand the inherent qualities of Grenache picking it a bit earlier, doing good things with a bit of culture, vinification-wise, almost treating it like Pinot and capturing that ethereal, light, um, fragrant quality that I think Grenache can show, along with those full-body characteristics too, because there are different styles. But overall, Grenache is a thin-skinned red variety like Pinot, deep, dark, concentrated Grenache. You should eye with it just a modicum of suspicion because that's probably not the greatest expression of Grenache. Um, and unfortunately, only 5% of annual crush, but man, there are some crackers. And you've got some really great examples uh, through the Yolumba portfolio. 
even starting at something like Yolumba Bushvine, which is right at the pointy end of the, the stick for that a, a, you know, approachable, easy drinking, chuck it in the fridge for 10 minutes kind of, uh, uh, kind of red wine where still enough structure, still enough interest to keep it uh, food friendly, but really light on its feet and completely lip smackingly delicious. Yeah, I think that the, um, the rise in prices of traditional Grenache suppliers from the rest of the world created an opportunity in Australia economically that they could actually put a focal point on this variety and interest. I think winemakers always liked it. They, I think bankers didn't love it, per se. No, probably not. Um, but you're seeing it. I'm seeing changes too. I, had, I did a, a seminar recently with some Grenache from Australia. Then someone brought to a dinner later a couple of you know newer, newer fangled uh, ganaches from Spain and some Rhone stuff, and you're seeing it happening. But mm-hmm. it's really ex- an exciting category in, um, in Australia, and Barossa specifically. It's, uh, it's really cool. With that old vine material, it's like, wow, it's, it's pretty cool. Push comes to shove, though. Hey, it's Shiraz. 66% of annual production in Barossa is Shiraz. Um, rich and robust in style. I mean, the reality in Barossa, and I'll try and sort of frame this carefully because I, uh, you, you are in a warm climate region. There's no two ways about it. So the reality is you're going to get full-bodied, robust kind of qualities. But last time I checked, Shannon if Pap is, is a warm climate. So it's pretty right. There's all, but it, just because a region has warmth, I think, the key thing to, to it's like anything in viticulture, but certainly the, the the challenge and the duty of the good winemakers in a warm climate is to tame that, to work with that. Bad wine in a warm climate is overripe, pruny, and 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 you know loses its focus. And any grape that ripens, no matter what grape it is, any grape that ripens to uh, over a certain point, that varietal character gets lost. It just becomes red wine. It's not it's not very uh, focused and specific. And the reality with uh, the great Shiraz we're seeing now from Barossa. Um, big concentrated styles exist, but that sort of harvesting with a little bit of raisinated fruit just doesn't happen anymore. It's just, that's not what people want. You used to see it with Zin in California. You see it in, in places around the world as well. But the reality is beautiful ripeness as opposed to over ripeness gives you richness, the intensity, but a purity and freshness as well. And I think that's what we're seeing more and more in Barossa. And I love that. I think that's a, a really exciting time. That Barossa, I, I'll be honest, 10, 15 years ago, Barossa was not the first Shiraz I would reach for in, 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 um, if I was reaching for Australia. Um, just they were too big, they were a bit too concentrated. Now it's like, oh, I'm reaching for them all the time. I love that richness and the warmth that they give, but there's also freshness and purity of fruit. And I think that's really key. Eden Valley. Um, yeah, it, like honestly, the Eden Valley discussion, it, it's unfair, but it's really about Henschke. <laughs> And um, it's not fair because there's other producers up there. There's some really good producers. But, man, when push comes to shove, this is – and I'm going to talk about Henschke later. But the reality is that um, important up in the Eden Valley, there's some really famous vineyard sites. And there was, you know, three words that Stephen Henschke said to me about how he thinks he defines Eden Valley. He's obviously talking about his own wines. Sage, black pepper, blackberry. And I think you could add a few other things in there, but absolutely spot on. Ever since he said that to me, and I love the sage element, sage or bay leaf, simply because there is a herbal note, but it's not a green and underripe herbal herbal note. It's that softer, warmer herbal note, and it's beautiful. It's a way to describe it. I'm going to wax lyrical about Henschke's wines later. Cabernet is super important still in Australia and in Barossa too, but you've got to be careful. Cabernet Sauvignon was a problematic variety in Australia, the oldest vineyard site for Cabernet. It's probably in Barossa. There's one in Langhorn Creek too, but 1880s. Um, but you've got to be in the right spot in Barossa. Cabernet doesn't like heat or drought stress, heat, heat stress or drought stress. And the reality is you have to be in those cooler sites. And there are some clay-based soils that have moisture retention that, that allow for Cabernet to do really well there. And there are people, you guys have an absolute beauty that you've probably been making for over 100 years at Yolumba, the, the signature. But that whole Cabernet Shiraz blend is extremely important. There are people still today that believe that's one of the greatest expressions of dry red wine in Australia. I'm saying I agree or disagree. It's just that's an important blend, never mind varietal. And I love Cabernet from Napa as a transition to bring people that have grown up on a steady diet of California Cabernets, Napa Cabernets, and Sonoma Cabernets. This is a great way to bring them. I'll talk about Margaret River in in the later sessions, which I love as I do with Kunawara. But Cabernet from Barossa is a little bit softer, a little bit more sort of familiar, if you like, to the, to the Napa drinker. Mm-hmm. Really agree. Eden Valley, yeah, you've got to be in the right spot in Eden. And uh, again, Hensky has a real, really uh, famous site up there. But Cabernet can ripen. You've got to be in protected, warmer sites for Cabernet to grow uh, well in Eden Valley. But can give you a little bit more of that herbaceousness that I quite like in Cabernet. I like that herb- herbal lift and that more medium weight quality. I think that's very, very appealing. 
And the rest of Barossa, um, there's all sorts of cool things happening. Semillon does really well there. Chardonnay, it's mostly the good stuff is in Eden Valley. There's a fair bit of Chardonnay in the Valley floor, but let's call a spade a spade. It's like the reality is that it's it's that's for commercial reasons. Um, Barossa Chardonnay itself, I, I think the, the better sites are up in Eden Valley for, for good quality uh, Chardonnay. Semillon, really, it's, it's a white variety that does incredibly well. There's some unbelievably old vineyard sites there. And the style seems to waver a little bit between a sort of hunter style picked a bit earlier or a more oak style that's be better for long uh, for, for long aging. Can be blended with Sauvignon Blanc sometimes too. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if you've got any. I think you've got any Sems coming in. Not at the moment. Not that I know of. It makes me sad because I'm a big fan. I had a funny feeling you had something from uh, Henschke at one point, but maybe not seeing it anymore. Well, it may, yeah, Henschke makes one. And it's just such a small... I think it's coming in. Uh, tough... But, Bit of a tough sell. Matara Morvedra, certainly see, you'll see that in blends in, in some of the wines. I don't think you've got any straight Morvedra is coming in in your portfolio, but you can certainly see it in some of the blends. And then the fortified discussion, again, for another time, but do not ignore it. It's, it's a small a, a proportion of Australia's production right now, but man, there are some absolute beauties. Yeah, the, just walking through Sepelt's field of the uh, 100 plus years all there in barrel where you can just walk by and just like... Uh, Wow, I could taste through a century of wine here if I had yeah. enough Australian dollars. <laughs> yeah, and I'll just I'll, I'll quickly talk about because even though they're coming back into the market, you guys aren't bringing it in, unfortunately. But there, you can go to Sepultsfield. There was a guy called Benno Seppelt in 1878. He said he had the foresight to say this, and it still happens today. One barrel of this wine, so it's a vintage dated tawny style port, if you like. So it's Colieta would be the the equivalent. Lay that wine down, not to be released for a hundred years, and they've done that since 1878. So the current release this last May was. 1910 and they just continue to do that and i've taken stom soms there and you taste your birth year and it's like it is one of those experiences that you never forget and that's a beautiful piece of the uh, barossa the australian winemaking history but barossa history too that i when i first visited that i was blown away i'm like why are we not singing this stuff from the rooftops because nobody and i spoke to christiana venzella a port producer friend of mine used to own um quinta de nacional the family did and he said we can show you older vintage ports than that, but we cannot show you a consecutive line of 100 years of vintage dated tawnies. We can't do it. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's awesome. Unbelievably cool. Yeah. That's uh, some brosser by the numbers for the geeky inclined. I'll leave that. Um, here, I'm not, I know you've got Earthworks, you've got a few other things in here, and my job is not to talk about your portfolio, but I do, <laughs> what I do want you to understand is what the hell you have, because you have some unbelievable producers and why they matter, I think, is important. I've put Pusey, even though it's under the Alumba family, I put these three in there because I think you need to understand uh, the importance of them. If there is royalty in wine globally, these two, this is the king and the queen. Now, they're certainly the king and queen in, in Australia as far as I'm concerned. And that for any of you that know them and are lucky enough to have met them, you don't meet nicer people. This is six generations now of um, grape growing um, and innovation. Yeah, kind of. When you think about some of the wines that are in your portfolio, Hill of Grace, obviously it's amazing. I don't know Hill of Grace that well. I've tried it certainly several times. I usually try it when I'm taking a group up there. Twice people have cried. One was a French Canadian lady. So that sort of doesn't count because she cried at all, all uh, points of the equation. She knows I know her really well. She'd laugh at that. But the reality is that it's one of those sort of religious experiences when you when you visit with them. The wines are as good as you would imagine. The wine that I always tend to pick on because, and I've shown it to more sommeliers than I can even imagine in the last sort of 10 years is Mount Edelston. Now it's not a cheap one either in your portfolio, but for what it represents, um, I think, and the Hill of Grace would be the same, but Mount Edelston to my mind is one of the most unique and brilliant expressions of single vineyard wine on the planet, Never mind what it's made from. It is categorically the most unique. I've actually, and not because I'm anything special, but you, I've identified it in blind tastings a few times, not because I'm special. It is because it's so singular and because it's so unique. And you you smell this and you go, damn, that is, that's got to be like Hilt. It's got to be uh, uh, Matt Edelson. It's, it's, and it was foresight. You got to remember, they first made that wine a um, single vineyard wine in the 50s. Nobody was doing that then. They were blending stuff. They weren't even naming a vineyard. They were blending between vineyards, but naming a vineyard, doing it, and they've just carried it on. It's absolutely magnificent. So Henschke, I mean, it you know, doesn't really require explanation, but in case of, for, the, for those of you relatively new to Australian wine, this 
this is one of the most famous um, uh, wine families, never mind on the planet, but in, in certainly in Australia. Yeah, they and, need to be talked about in the same conversation as classified growth Bordeaux and Grand no question. property in Burgundy and the long-term elite of Napa Valley. That yeah. the, this is this is where those people live in in their quality of production and their in their vision. And what I thought was great about our conversation with Johan about what they're doing to innovate, their innovation is a lack of change. Instead of forcing change just to change. They stuck with what they knew they could do, and their innovations were more about managing land than changing dynamic winemaking processes. And I thought, wow, that's that's really good. Once you yeah. know you got it dialed, don't change it just to change it. <laughs> uh, but Prue's tinkering, though. She's uh, viticulturally, she's been tinkering for a long time, which I think is amazing. But yeah, you're absolutely right. The way they approach their winemaking is very traditional. Um, but they are planning, like for example, there's a bit of a shift in Chardonnay to Pap right now, pulling out Syrah and planting um, Sanso. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think a bit of Carignan, she's done the same. They've got some uh, vineyard sites in, in there. They've got a site that I was there and they'd already picked everything. It was three weeks later and it still hadn't ripened. So you know, in response to climate change. Exactly. Another important family, the Alumbo, um, the Smil- Hillsmith family, um, I think by a week, they're the oldest family run business because the Henchkeys, remember, were growers initially, but this this business is the, is, is the oldest. You're going to be dealing, Robert's sort of, I love Robert. I've known him for years. He's in the background, but not really. <laughs> he's still he's still pulling a few strings. He'd laugh if he heard me say that. But Jess Hill Smith is um, is amazing. Um, I spent a bit of time with her uh, uh, last year when she was on the the roadshow with us. Uh, you're going to see her a lot more in the market when <laughs> that changes. South Australia just went into lockdown again over overnight. Um, but Yolumba is a really important producer in Australia and uh, globally. And I think sometimes, and maybe some people won't like me saying this, but I can because I don't work for you guys. The reality is I think sometimes the bigger brands that are known by Yolumba overshadow what's super cool about Yolumba. There are some wines in the portfolio there that you should be singing from the rafters about. Bushfine Grenache is one of them. One of my sneaky favorites. And the value for money of this wine is kind of kind of astonishing. But um, Signature is like hands down one of the great expressions of that Shiraz Cab blend. And year in, year out, it is magnificent. And what, I don't know, what's the retail on it? Run 50 bucks, 55 bucks, 60 bucks? Probably can't quote it, but it's not, it's not. The quality you're getting would be double the price in Napa. Exactly. Nice comparison. I love, and I'm never, I always feel like I'm picking on Napa when I look at pricing. I'm actually not because I wish we were getting the prices. I wish we did what Napa did. Uh, but the reality is that what do you get for 50 bucks from Napa? Appalachian Napa, not a lot right now. And, you know, you get a lot in Australia and, and, and never mind the Grenache program that they've been tinkering with. It was, you know, it's really cool. I love what they're doing there. They've got so much good stuff there and it's a wonderful visit too. They have a cooperage there. It's an important producer. And then obviously the Pusey Vale discussion, you've seen the vineyard site. Um, when I started with Wine Australia, I remember thinking, man, Pusey Vale, it's like, I don't know, I, I, I don't know what you can get it down to on good, on good sort of case discounts, but it's the kind of wine that should be on by the glass everywhere. That regular Riesling, you can convert so many people and I've you've done it with just like, you just got to taste this wine. The problem with it, it says Riesling on the label. What's in the glass is just, it, it, it's magnificent. Then mm. you look, you add to that equation, the, the um, contours, the age worthiness of contours, and it's crazy. Yes. Been fortunate to have contours with 20 plus years of bottle age and it was still green. It was That's, yeah, it's ridiculous. So those, the wine age. And they, the Pusey was put under screw cap um, in the 70s. They were way mm-hmm. ahead of their time. Then they sort of changed again and came back to it. But I've had some really old Puseys and, and you're just like, well, these wines are just astonishing. The age worthiness of those wines is, is quite uh, quite scary. What, now, we're going to have a quick look at New South Wales. We're really going to look at Canberra District and we're really just going to talk about Clonakilla because I think that's important. Um, but New South Wales was actually, uh, and Hunter Valley was the first major region. So New South Wales is where the first colonies were. And that's, you know, so New South Wales is an important uh, um, uh, wine producing state. Hunter Valley being the most important. Way for, way later in the history was a, an area called Canberra District. Um, but it's, yeah, you, yeah, it's hard to, to, to really articulate what you have in Clonakilla. Quick look at Hunter. You can look at this yourself just to re- remind yourself, even though it's not in your portfolio, you still have, you know, Hunter's a really important piece of the uh, winemaking equation in the history of Australia um, with, you know, an amazing, unique, arguably the most unique expression of semi anywhere on the planet, but also a really cool style of Shiraz that even in, in spite of the warm climate there, 
the mm. curiosity is the ones come across as sort of medium bodied and almost cool climate. They're sort of red fruited and savory. Yeah, for the wholesale teams on this webinar, this definitely applies to them where we have broadband because we do have that category covered in one of the very best when we are oh good broadband at broadband selections at the wholesale level. Oh well, there I didn't I, actually I didn't realize that, but um, absolutely for sure because you've got yeah you've got uh, Tyrrell, yes, one of the exactly. great producers. So Canberra District is an interesting one because um, normally this wouldn't even be in a presentation because there's not many wines from Canberra District, but you happen to have one of the greatest. Um, so it's an emerging wine scene, a real sort of um, innovative area, geology and climate. It's kind of interesting. It's the wines present themselves again as sort of cooler climate styles, that sort of more medium bodied and peppery and, and, and sort of fragrant. I don't know that Canberra would ca technically fit there. It's got elevation there. It wouldn't technically fit as cool climate, sort of more moderate climate. So it's really about Shiraz that brought fame to the Canberra district. And then there's really Clonakilla and the story of uh, the Kirk family that is where it's all at. And this is the particular wine. If anyone's had the Shiraz Viognier, and I know you guys have just gotten, I think that's maybe it's just landed now for the current vintage. I think it might be 18 coming in, or I don't know what's going on because they you didn't make wine in 20. So it's, that is a picture from Shiraz. That's the Shiraz Viognier being made in at, uh, at Clonakilla. Um, I think he's making a picture of the globe in the middle. <laughs> yeah. well, I, I, always, I also love this picture too, because when, when you speak to a producer and they say that they say it's 2% this, 5% that, it's like, it's not a real science. There's a bucket or two of Shiraz that goes in there. So a quick note on why this is an interesting blend. Tim went to, um, um, he came back into the family business and uh, he went to, to in the nineties, he went and tasted Cote Rotu and couldn't believe what he was experiencing as Anyone that's done that as a youngster, but I did too. And I was just like, wow, how do you walk a tightrope of intensity and power and delicacy and fragrance at the same time in, in one glass? And that's what I think great Coat Roti does. And that's what he was trying to achieve. And he can with his climate and he can with that little addition of, of, uh, uh, of Viognier in there. And he, you know, basically made it and everyone was like, what have you done here? And it spurred on a lot of other people doing cab, uh, sorry, Shiraz Viognier blends, mm -hmm. which were co ferments, but that's also gone away a little bit and there's a few really good examples of it, thankfully, because every man and his dog were, were, were producing a, a Shiraz Viognier and it got a bit tedious. But there, this expression, I'd never had it before and I was in Australia and I read something about Jancis Robinson. I was like, well, I've never even heard of this winery. When, when did they start? And they started in the 70s, so clearly I felt I was out of touch. Found a bottle, tasted it side by side with a coat routine. I was, it's those, you know, you have those moments in wine where you go, everything I thought about something has just changed and that changed my perception of what was possible with this variety in Australia. And year in, year out, you try these wines and you are completely and utterly taken by the perfume, the balance, the intensity and that delicacy. And it's uh, you, yeah, what you've got there is they're not cheap, but they bloody well shouldn't be because this is, you know, very specific about where you can and should sell them, but they're amazing, amazing wines. All right. So do you mind taking a break here for a quick question? Yeah, we're done. Yeah, no, no, we're, we're basically done. Uh, uh, so the question is uh, a little bit more uh, information about co-fermenting Viognier and Shiraz and why or why if not a producer would choose to do so. What's okay. the primary reason, et cetera? And I'm, I'm happy to chime in, but I know you So are. there is, there's a chemical equation that's on there. It actually applies to any white variety in there. There's something that's to do with catechins and a whole bunch of things that I'm not qualified to speak about, but there's something that goes on about with a white variety being co-fermented with a, a, with a, with a red that helps set color because what happens is color is unstable during the fermentation uh, uh, period. It's an unstable issue. That's not why they're doing it for this in Australia. We don't have an issue with color, um, but the stability is an interesting thing. It sets the color early and that keeps the color, but it's all, it's about a texture and an arom aroma thing. And it's not just about the Viognier aromas coming out because they do. It brings out that perfumed violety thing that is inherent in cooler climate grown um, Shiraz that brings this perfume. Plus it's a texture thing. When, when you speak to the good producers there, they say there's a slippery sort of texture that we're looking for. It's a textual thing as much as it is about aromas, and aromatics. And so, yeah, it was this thing that was done likely in coat rotation. It was probably just because they're co-planted and they just pick it and away you go. They just do probably started almost by accident. But then once you realize that there's a beautiful, because I remember being um, charmed by it thinking, oh yeah, but that's the Viognier giving the perfume. Then trying another Coat Roti that had no Viognier in it and it had a similar perfume. And you can see that with Tim's wines too. Side by side, 
he's got some Shiraz or Shiraz that he's growing that have the perfume at the same time. But it's just, it's a beautiful thing. So it's about perfume, aroma, um, yeah, uh, texture is, is the main reason. And yeah, if you want to kind of do an experiment on your own, whoever asked the question about fixing the color, one of the things I've convinced people to do just to see it happen in front of their eyes is to take just traditional grape juice, like Welch's grape juice and some pineapple juice and just drop a little pineapple juice in there and you watch the color go from purple to purple. And that's sort of what's happening in the fermentation tank. Yeah. It's uh, And if you think about that in Koroti, where they did have an issue fixing color, because it's much further north than what people give it credit, yeah. it makes a lot of sense there. And what, don't we just love these accidents that turn into great wine? Like whoever decided the first time that they should use fish bladders to clarify their wine, and now we have Eisenglass. I mean, I mean, <laughs> this weird yeah, stuff. Yeah, I always used to, I'm always puzzled by that one. I think someone must have been on some serious drugs saying, let's use the swim bladder of a tropical fish to clarify wine. <laughs> to have that. Yeah. I, How's know. the acid, dude? Um, but anyway, I mean, I just I think that, um, and we'll as we continue through these uh, these next few uh, sessions, uh, you know, month by month, I don't think we've got the dates all set. But the reality is, as we get, make our way through these sessions, what I'm hoping to do is just give you guys some language around it, make you realize what you've got in your portfolio. And I don't say that being trying to suggest that some of you don't know, but you have just within the space of three producers that we talked about today with your Lumber, Henschke, and Clonic Killer. That's something. <laughs> That's like, yeah, you've got three, uh, some of the you know most classic producers in Australia that side. But you could argue, I mean, Henschke is certainly up there, but you could put Tim Kirk's Shiraz Viena up there as one of the greatest red wines produced in Australia and combine that with Henschke and it's like, I don't know, what else do you want? Yeah. So, yeah. A couple more questions, if you're willing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the first one is about, Aging Riesling in Eden Valley, or the bottled versions, I'm assuming that they're asking, and how it differentiates yeah. from uh, FLX or German. I'm assuming that they meant um, Austrian, perhaps, or... Um, yeah, I don't know what FLX stands for, but, um, but oh, yeah, I can talk, talk a bit about that. I've had been lucky enough in my earlier sommelier career to try some really old German Rieslings, and I do think there's a correspondence, correspondence eventually. Mm -hmm. I think you get there eventually, but with some serious age. But the reality is that... Um, they, I think what, you, what you're seeing in, with sort of classic sort of German, um, uh, German Mosel Riesling, for example, and maybe a bit more peachy kind of qualities that you're getting in, uh, in uh, the Rheingau and the uh, Falt, the reality is they, they do age a little bit differently, largely because there's not much sugar in, in a lot of the Aussie versions. And that lemon-lime thing is prominent for a really long time, which then turns into people talk about petroleum and all that sort of thing. I, I think that exists in some of the German Rieslings as well. But I think what you get is this marmalade thing. Now, I always say to the Aussie producers, you can say marmalade all you want, but in North America, a lot of people don't really eat marmalade. But it is a good descriptor because as you get down the road, they do age slowly because most of them are under screw cap nowadays. But you do eventually get to this strange, almost toasty creme brulee thing, which does happen. I've had old Bernkastler doctors and I've had old Pusies and I've had old Clare Valley Rieslings and they do end up with that almost toasty creme brulee thing. And uh, from what I can understand, that is because there's no oak, but mm -hmm. the same thing that exists, there are things called wood lactones that exist in oak, but there are lactones that exist in wine. And I checked with a, 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 the AWRI as to what is that toasty thing. And they said, it's something to do with wood lactones, but we don't know. And I figure, well, if they don't know, I don't need to know. <laughs> so, and yeah. The... Uh when you start to look at how these wines are aging, they're both essentially aging primarily on their pH, their low pH. And so that process is going to be similar. And some of the old German wines that are beautiful are not really all that sweet either because they weren't always made that way. That's um, right. Yeah. You're really looking at, I think what we're going to be looking at going forward is the way uh, Claire and Eden Valley Rieslings, the top flight ones especially age in comparison with Grossesknecht's dry Rieslings out of their emerging warmth that we didn't have over the years. And I think when you and I are much older, we'll have a, we'll have a comparative uh, that's a little closer than the new than what we have now. Well, this is yeah. about China, because China's a big deal for Australia. I have not really been aware of how serious uh, Australia is about Chinese imports from Australia into China. So what are the influences on the industry in terms of grapes, products, et cetera, knowing how important China is to exports, and obviously, how might that affect us here in this country? 
Uh, yeah, there's some stuff going on with tariffs right now that could create some challenges, which I'm not really going to speak about because we don't know. There's a lot of unknowns. Um, but the reality is China's been our biggest export market for the last couple of years. Uh, white wine's not so much. That's just changing in China. Um, white wine drinking was not part of the equation. The, to do with a cold beverage thing historically in, in China, they're not big fans of colder beverages. But the reality is that red wines have been crazy. Barossa has been important. Uh, full-bodied red wines have been incredibly important in, in uh, China for us. So um, that's you know how that affects us. I think there was a lot of focus on China, and I think the smart producers – diversify because throwing all your eggs into one basket is not an, not a smart um, uh, way to look at things. I think what we're going to start seeing is uh, more people throw, you know, showing a bit of enthusiasm with a little bit of um, uncertainty in China right now, whether, whether that plays out the way some people are anticipating or not. I think people are excited about the US again because I think the image of Australia has changed and people want to do business here again. We're seeing it with our market entry program. People want to come and do it. But I think what we try to do our best job to, to explain to people when they want to come to the US is you have to recognize where the challenges and opportunities lie in the US. And the challenges are it's 50 countries. Don't think you're coming to, to work in one country. You're coming to work with all the challenges that exist within you know, state to state and distribution um, issues that exist. So, But we're seeing a lot, lot of people wanting to be back into the market here. And yeah, it's exciting. Whereas in the past, you couldn't even get people. Distributors didn't want to pick up the wines. Even in my time with Wine Australia, distributors weren't interested. Suppliers weren't interested. It's like, oh, wow. But now it's all like, hey. So it's, it's cool. Nice to see that. That's and you guys are so well established with such a brilliant brands that, yeah, it's a good position to be in. Fabulous. And that's the end of our questions. So I just want to thank everybody for joining. And I want to thank Mark. And here's some great resources. Don't forget about AustralianWineDiscovered.com. I, I use that. TJ has used it to help us build modules. Uh, if you have specific questions, reach out to Mark.Davidson at WineAustralia.com. Or send them to me and I'll send them along, however it works out. Uh, Mark, thank you for spending this time with us. And I look forward to next month. Hey, everybody, you'll be getting an invite very shortly for our next opportunity. Uh, and then those after that. Um, this is a great resource and we really appreciate uh, having access to you. Thank you. Thank you for your time, guys. Thank you. See you next month.